Dialogue one. What's that you've got there? It's about yetis. It's got some great photographs of them. Oh, I thought they didn't exist. Well, according to this, they found footprints in the snow, and one man says he even shot one of them with a gun. Really? That's amazing. Can I borrow it when you're finished? Yes, of course you can. Dialogue two. Oh, look, Amy, the lost city of Atlantis. That's the one about the city under the sea. Do you want to go and see it? I'm not sure, Jackie. I haven't read very good reviews of it. What time is it on? Um, six o'clock and nine o'clock. You could call the others. Maybe some of them want to go. You could go to the first showing, and I could meet you in the cafe afterwards. Okay, good idea. Let's do that. Dialogue three. Some people say they were built as a kind of calendar, you know, so that they could predict the seasons. Hmm. I don't think I really believe all that stuff. They just seem like interesting buildings to me. You're probably right. Still, it's a mystery how they did it. Do you think so? I think they just did it using a lot of men. It was probably really hard work, but I don't honestly see what all the mystery is about it. Don't you? I think it's amazing. Dialogue four. Have you heard of the Mary Celeste? I saw a program about it on TV. It was found sailing on the Atlantic, and all the sailors had disappeared. So where were they? That's the strange thing. No one knows. Everyone on board had vanished. They even found meals that were half eaten. Very strange. Hey, Luke. What? Uh. Oh, sorry, Simon. Didn't see you there. It's just that this book is so interesting that I don't notice anything else. Sorry. That's okay. What's it about? The Bermuda Triangle. The Bermuda what? Triangle. Haven't you heard of it? It's an area of sea between Florida, Puerto Rico, and Bermuda. And what's so interesting about an area of sea? Well, there's a great mystery surrounding the Bermuda Triangle. Things keep well disappearing there. Disappearing? What things? Ships, planes. Well, they probably just crash or sink, don't they? Some of them do, but others just seem to well vanish. Something like two hundred planes have disappeared in the last sixty years, like this one. See the picture? In nineteen sixty-five, two people were flying in a plane like that over Bermuda on a clear, sunny day. When it just disappeared from the radar screen, that's never been explained. Really? Yes, and it's the same story with boats. In 1918, there was a ship called the Cyclops, with 306 people on it. It was in the Bermuda Triangle, and it just disappeared and was never seen again. That's a real mystery. Isn't there any explanation? Well, yes, but different people have different ideas about it. Some people blame aliens. What? That sounds crazy to me. What do you think? I think there's probably a natural explanation for most of the disappearances. You know, a sudden storm could easily destroy a ship, and it's very easy for a pilot to get lost over the sea. So maybe it's not so mysterious after all. Maybe there are still some disappearances that are hard to explain, though. Even today, with all our modern technology. There are one or two a year. It's a great book. You should read it. I think I'd love to go and visit Bermuda one day, just to have a look. Yes, that sounds wonderful. Talking of disappearing, I have to go. Lots of work to do. See you later. Yes. Okay. See you later. One. Yes, I've heard of the Bermuda Triangle. It's in the Atlantic Ocean. And it's where planes and ships keep disappearing, isn't it? There are lots of little islands around there, but I don't think it's a very dangerous area, so it's a real mystery. I think the best explanation I heard was that the sea in that area produces lots of gas, and it can make ships sink and make planes suddenly drop out of the sky. I'm not a scientist, but it makes a lot of sense to me. Two. Oh yes, the Bermuda Triangle. I saw a documentary about that once. 
They interviewed local people about all the planes and ships that had disappeared and asked what their theories were. Some of them talked about problems with the electrics on a plane, but it didn't sound right to me. I think it's to do with visitors from other planets. They want to study us, so they take some of us and use that area as a laboratory. At least that's what I think. Everyone's got their own opinion about it, and that's mine. 3. The Bermuda Triangle? Yes, I've heard of it. I don't know much about it, but I do know that it's a very mysterious area. I know that the American Army and Air Force have lost lots of planes in that area. I don't think anyone knows for sure why that is. You can't explain it by looking at the weather conditions because it's such a calm, peaceful area. No, I think that behind the whole mystery, you'll find that it's pilots getting lost or captains going the wrong way. Simple accidents, if you ask me. Well, um, my name's Carl, although some of my friends call me Tiny, and I'm 38 years old. How time flies, eh? It seems like only yesterday I was 18. I live in London. Uh, well, I'm from London. I was born there and uh, grew up there. I don't live there now. I've been in prison for the past two years, and I've got another two years until I get out. There are three of us in my family, me, my wife, and my daughter Liz. Liz goes to primary school at the moment. Anyway, when I lost my job, I'm an accountant, we didn't have enough money, even though my wife also works as a secretary. So I decided to... Don't laugh. Rob a bank. It was the worst decision I've ever made. I can't believe I was so stupid. I hate it in prison. I can't wait to get out. I work in the kitchen, um, so I have to get up at four o'clock in the morning to make breakfast. The rest of the time I just sit in my cell. I like reading, which is good since I'm on my own a lot here. When I get out in two years' time, I'm going to try to find a job. And I'll tell you something. I'll never commit another crime again. One. He was quite tall, about, well, mm, I'd say about 25 years old. He was white, had short dark hair, and an earring in his left ear. Oh, and he was wearing jeans and a black T-shirt. Two. He was definitely wearing a blue shirt and jeans. His hair was quite long. Dark hair, I think. Yeah, black. What else? His age? Oh, he wasn't young. In his late forties or early fifties, I'd say. Three. He was in his mid-thirties with short brown hair. He didn't have an earring. I know one of the other witnesses said he did, but he didn't. He did have a gold chain around his neck, though. His clothes, he was wearing a black shirt and jeans. One. As soon as I saw him, I called the police on my mobile. They asked for a description on the phone, so I gave them one. I remember everything in great detail. Well, I got a very good look at him. He was in his mid-thirties with short brown hair. He didn't have an earring. I know one of the other witnesses said he did, but he didn't. He did have a gold chain around his neck, though. His clothes, he was wearing a black shirt and jeans. The funniest thing was when he started running down the street with the TV because he dropped it and it smashed into hundreds of little pieces. <laughs> you should have seen his face. Two. 
I saw the whole thing very clearly. You see, I'd just been to the bank and was walking down the street to run into the supermarket to get some milk. Well, I couldn't believe it. He was just helping himself to a TV out of the shop window. I don't know if he smashed the window himself. I didn't see that. But I did get a good look at him. He was quite tall, about, well, mm, I'd say about 25 years old. He was white, had short dark hair, and an earring in his left ear. Oh, and he was wearing jeans and a black t shirt. 3. Well, I didn't get a very good look at him because I was in the car driving past, you know. But he was definitely wearing a blue shirt and jeans. His hair was quite long. Dark hair, I think. Yeah, black. What else? His age? Oh, he wasn't young. In his late forties or early fifties, I'd say. The first we heard of it, a woman, Celine Devanti is her name, called the police station from her mobile phone. That was at twenty past three in the afternoon on Thursday, the 13th of September last year. Mr. Vanti was standing in Winchester Street in the town centre and said she could see a man trying to steal a television from the smashed window of Jasper and Sons electrical suppliers. The police station radioed me. I was in my police car at the time and I raced to Winchester Street. When I got there, I met Mr. Vanti and several other witnesses standing outside the shop. There was a broken TV about ten metres further down the pavement. Each of the witnesses gave me a description of the thief who had run off when he dropped the TV. Their descriptions were not all the same, and it wasn't clear whether his hair was long or short, whether his shirt was black or blue, or what kind of jewellery he was wearing. It appeared, however, that the person we wanted was a white male with dark hair who was wearing jeans. Well, a lot of people fit that description, so it was difficult to know where to start looking. In fact, we caught the thief within an hour. At quarter past four, I got a message saying a man had been caught shoplifting by a security guard at a local department store called Madison's. When I got to the shop, the man seemed to fit the description of the TV thief. Eventually, he confessed to the crime and to another eight similar crimes. His name's Adrian Fisher, and he's 44 years old. He was sent to prison for four and a half years. Oh, that TV program's on now, Fame Idol. It's where singers try to become famous. Shall we watch it, Alex? Oh, no, not that, Suzanne. I really don't understand why anyone wants to be famous. And half of them can't sing. That's true, but I'd love to be famous, like Victoria Beckham. You could have everything you wanted. I totally disagree. You're talking about being rich, and that's not the same thing at all. It's very hard being famous, never having a private life. I see what you mean, but imagine what it's like to be Tom Cruise or Kylie Minogue. Your fans all love you. I'm afraid I don't agree with you. Just because people buy magazines with photos of those people, it doesn't mean they love them in reality. Yes, I suppose you're right. It is hard if everyone recognizes you, but I still think it's worth it. Now, turn the TV on and be quiet. Each of the Harry Potter books has been a great success, and some of them have even been made into Hollywood films. Both children and adults seem to like the characters and the entertaining stories. The Adventures of Harry Potter, the Young Wizard, and his friends at Hogwarts School have brought pleasure to millions of readers of all ages. But what about the creator of Harry Potter, J.K. Rowling? What is the story behind this best-selling author? Joanne Rowling was born in Chipping Sodbury, a small town in the west of England, near the city of Bristol. She always wanted to be a writer, even from a very young age, and would entertain her sister Di with her stories. When she was nine, her family moved to the countryside, and she and her sister used to spend their time playing in the fields. 
When she went to secondary school, Joanne's favourite subjects were English and foreign languages. She was a quiet, shy teenager, and she often told her friends stories during the break. These stories were usually about themselves doing exciting things. As she got older, she continued to write. She went to Exeter University, where she studied French. She worked as a secretary for a short while before going to Portugal, where she taught English. All the time she was there, she worked on her Harry Potter stories, but she had no idea that she would one day make a fortune from her writing. These days, J.K. Rowling lives with her children and husband in Scotland. She is one of the richest people in England and has won many awards for her books. People of all ages from all around the world can't wait for her to finish the next book, so that they can find out what is happening to Harry Potter and his friends. One. Do you know who I've always admired? Bill Gates. He's the man who founded Microsoft, the computer software company. In the 1970s, he realised that one day everyone would have a PC on their desk and in their home, and he started writing programs. His most successful idea was Windows. I think he's one of the richest men in the whole world now. Two. I think one of my heroes is Nelson Mandela. He was born in 1918 in South Africa. When he grew up, he became involved in politics. At the time, the black people in South Africa faced a lot of problems from the white government. Mandela believed in using violence to change the situation, and he was put in prison. He was in prison for 27 years, but he never lost hope. When he was released, he soon became the president of South Africa. I think his story teaches us that we should never give up. Three. One of the most famous astronauts is John Glenn. He was the first American to go into space. That was in 1962. He went up in a rocket and went around the Earth three times. The most amazing thing about him is that he went into space again. Thirty-seven years later, he went on a space shuttle mission in 1998 when he was 77 years old. The aim was to study how being in space affects old people. I think it's great that he showed how you're never too old to do amazing things. Four. The famous person I most admire is Brad Pitt. I think he can act really well. He was born in 1963 in Oklahoma, and grew up in Missouri. He had a fairly normal, happy childhood, and he loved films from a very young age. He was always at the cinema, watching whatever was playing. After university, where he studied journalism, he moved to California, and spent all his spare money on acting lessons. He got some work in television. And finally appeared in a major film in 1991. Now he's one of Hollywood's top actors. One. The space age began on October the fourth, 1957, when the Soviet Union launched the world's first man-made satellite, called Sputnik One. It was about the size of a basketball. And took only ninety-eight minutes to go all the way round Earth. Two. Although several animals had travelled into space beforehand, including a dog called Laika, the first human to travel in space was a Russian astronaut called Yuri Gagarin. His incredible trip around the world took place in nineteen sixty-one. Three. Today, there are thousands of satellites outside the Earth's atmosphere. We use them to send phone calls, TV programs, and other kinds of information all round the world. The Earth only has one natural satellite, though, the Moon, which is about three hundred and eighty-five thousand kilometers away. 
Four. The first person to set foot on the moon was Neil Armstrong, an American, in 1969. Five. Pluto is similar to the Earth in that it only has one moon. Six. Although Pluto and the Earth only have one moon each, Saturn has lots of moons, twenty-four in fact. No other planet in the solar system has so many moons. Seven. The sun and the Earth, the planets and everything else in the solar system are constantly moving through space, and they're moving fast, two hundred and forty kilometers a second. Eight. The moon goes round the Earth once a day, and the Earth goes round the sun once a year. But the sun, and in fact the whole solar system, is also revolving as part of a galaxy called the Milky Way. It takes a bit longer than a day or a year to go round, though. In fact, it takes two hundred and twenty-five million years to go round once. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Universal Truth, the show that explores the incredible universe we live in. I'm very pleased to have with me today Jan Davis, professor of astronomy at Middleton University. Jan, thanks for coming on the show. My pleasure, Carl. In fact, I often listen to the program. I think it's very informative and interesting. Well, thank you very much. Now, Jan. Let me start by asking you about the solar system. I wonder if you could explain exactly what the solar system is. Yes, of course. Well, first of all, there's something I'd like to point out. There are billions of solar systems in the universe. There isn't just one. A solar system always has a big star at the center. Lots of other smaller things like planets, comets, or asteroids all go round that star. Now, our star is the sun. And so our solar system is everything that goes round the sun, the Earth, our moon, and the planets, for example. Okay. And now this may be a silly question, but why do they go round the sun? <laughs> It's not a silly question at all. It's a very good question. When you drop something, it falls on the floor, doesn't it? Yes, because of gravity. Well, it's exactly the same thing here. Nobody's sure exactly what gravity is. But we do know it's an attraction between two things, two objects. The thing you drop on the floor is attracted to the Earth. It falls to the ground because the Earth is heavier than it is. Now the Moon is also attracted to the Earth, which is why it doesn't fly away into space. And the Earth and the planets are attracted to the Sun because they're much lighter than the Sun. Oh, I see. Right. Now. The solar system's part of the Milky Way, isn't it? What's that exactly? Well, we've talked about solar systems. Now we have to talk about galaxies. A galaxy is a huge group of stars and solar systems which move around together. The Milky Way is the galaxy that we are part of, and the Milky Way is going round in a big circle. It takes two hundred and twenty-five million years to go all the way round. That's a long time. It certainly is. We often have to think about big numbers when we talk about the universe. If you think our sun is a star, the only star in our solar system, and in the Milky Way there are approximately a hundred billion stars. That's a hundred thousand million stars. If we write that down, that's a one and then eleven zeros after it. A huge number. That is huge. Yes. You see, the galaxy is enormous. Astronomers usually measure distance in space by something called light years. A light year is the distance that light can travel in one year, which is nearly ten thousand billion kilometers. Well, the Milky Way is a hundred thousand light years across. Wow! And how many galaxies are there in the universe? Well, we don't know for sure, of course, but we think there are billions of them. So. We live on one planet, which goes round one star, 
in a galaxy which has billions of stars, and the universe itself has billions of galaxies. That's exactly right. It does make you think, doesn't it? It certainly does. Jan, thanks so much for talking to us today. Thank you. Well, I suppose I know lots of people. I've got a few really close friends, like Sam, for example. She's probably my best friend because we've got a lot in common. She's really amusing and is always making me laugh. We spend most of our free time together. Then there's my family, of course. I've got a twin brother, Tony, but we're not really like other twins. Most of the time, we just argue and annoy each other. I don't like fighting, but he does things like come into my room without my permission, and it makes me really angry. Another person I see quite often is Mrs. Wilkins. She gives private music lessons, and she's teaching me the clarinet. I like her because she's never sarcastic or unkind when I play wrong notes. She's very friendly, and all her students like her. And then there are people I don't see very often, like my cousin Terry. Terry lives quite far away, so I only see her about once or twice a year. We get on very well, and she's always willing to listen to my problems and give me advice. I know that she understands, and she tries to help if she can. One. Katie, it's me, Sam. About the cinema tonight. You won't believe it, but my brother's broken his arm. My parents have taken him to hospital, so it means I have to stay here to look after the baby. You know how much I hate babysitting. Anyway, I can't make it. I'm sorry. I know it's annoying, but there's nothing I can do. The film's on until Friday, I think. So maybe we can go one day next week. Give me a call when you've got a minute, and we'll arrange something. Bye for now. Two. Katie, it's Tony. Listen, Mum said I should tell you that you were right and I was wrong. She went into my room and tidied up, so I shouldn't have accused you of moving my CDs. It's just that you know how much it annoys me when people touch my things. That's all. See you at home later. Bye. Three. It's Mrs. Wilkins, Katie. Oh, um, is this recording? I really don't like leaving messages. Um, well, it was about tomorrow's lesson. I told you that it's going to be an hour earlier than usual. Did I explain that it's because I have to go to see my sister in Brighton? Anyway, just checking that you haven't forgotten. Have you practiced this week? See you at seven at my place. Um, that's all. Bye. Four. Hi, Katie. Guess who? It's Terry. It seems like ages since I last saw you. When was it? January? Yes, it was January because we went on that terrible skiing holiday. I hate being cold. I'm so glad the summer's finally here, and that means I'm coming to see you next week. You haven't forgotten, have you? I was wondering if you could ask your dad to meet me at the station. I'm going to have lots of bags. You know me. I always take all my clothes wherever I go. Call me later to let me know. If I'm not at home, call my mobile. Bye. Hi, Zoe. What's that you're reading? Oh, hi, Jack. This it's a magazine article that our English teacher gave us to read. It's about different personalities. It's got a quiz to find out what kind of person you are. What do you mean? Well. You answer the questions, and at the end, the quiz tells you what you're like. Do you want to try it? Yeah, sure. Okay. First question then. What do you look for in a friend? Do you like people who a tell jokes, b give advice, or c gossip a lot? Let me think. Well, definitely not c. I can't stand people who gossip. I don't think it's very nice to talk about other people when they're not there. Um, not b. Because I keep my problems to myself, so let's see. A, yes, definitely A. People who tell jokes. Really? Hmm. Maybe that's because you're a boy. I'm not sure that's very important to me. With my friends, I think I prefer people who give advice. So I'd say B. I like my friends to help me when I've got problems. Okay then. What about the next question? Question two. Which of these do you dislike? 
A. People being late. B. People borrowing money. Or C. People telling lies. Dislike. Hmm. Let me think. Not A. People being late because that's usually me. I think my friends find it a bit annoying, to be honest. I suppose I would say C. People telling lies. Yes, I agree. I think I would say C as well. It's really annoying when people don't tell the truth, isn't it? You have to be able to trust people. Right. Next question. Which of these adjectives describes your best friend? A. Hardworking. B. Attractive. Or C. Intelligent. Hmm. Well, my best friend is Bill. He's in my year at school and he's very clever. He's always coming top of his class and I'm never top of mine. He doesn't have to work all the time either to come top. So I'd say C. Okay, I think I'd say B. My best friend is Alicia, and she's really pretty. I like people who are attractive. I don't know why. Any questions left? One more. Question four. Which of these do you hate the most? A. People who take life seriously. B. People who worry. Or C. People who argue. Oh, that's a difficult one. Let me think. Everyone worries about some things, don't they? So not that one. And we all have to take life seriously sometimes. So I suppose I would say, C. People who argue. What about you? Oh, I disagree. I don't mind arguments. I think that sometimes you have a better relationship after a good argument. No, I'd say B. People who worry, because they make me feel worried too. So, what do my answers mean then? Let me see. Your answers were A, C, 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 mostly C's. It says you have fun with your friends and like to have a good time. Well, that's true. What about you? I said B, C, B, B, mostly B's. It says you can trust your friends to help when you have a problem. That's true as well. That's interesting. Let me have a look at what else it says. One. It was so scary. We were terrified. I had no idea it would be so frightening. All these monsters and skeletons kept appearing and jumping out at us. It was really good fun. I wanted to go on again. Two. We had to queue up for over an hour, as it's the most popular ride at the park. The wait was worth it, though. We sat right at the front, which I think is the most exciting place to sit. You go up and up and up, and then suddenly you're at the top. You can see the whole park, and then you're going down, and everyone's screaming. You know, you're just going so fast, you think the wheels are going to come off the track. And then at one point, you go completely upside down. It's just fantastic. And just when you think the ride's over, you start going backwards and go all the way round the track again. Just brilliant. Three. Actually, I thought it was a bit boring, really. I mean, you do get a good view of the park from the top, but you're just going round in a slow circle, and it's not very exciting. Better for young kids, really. Four. Yeah, I didn't want to try this as I thought it was a bit boring, but Dad persuaded me to have a go, and it was really good fun. You get six chances to shoot the target, and if you knock it over, you win a prize. I won a teddy. It's really cute. Five. Well, I went with my dad, and my mum went with my brother. My dad let me drive. It was so cool. You can actually go quite fast, and when you bump into someone else, it's really funny. My mum kept yelling, "No, don't crash into us!" But of course, that's what it's all about. My brother loved it, but I was a much better driver than he was. Six. This was also one of the best rides at the park. It's a good thing we went on at the end of the day, though, as we got so wet, completely soaked. My jeans were still wet in the car on the way home. I'm glad we went on it. Mum screamed when we hit the bottom of the slide, and a whole load of water came into the boat. It was so funny. One. Yeah, I went with Debbie and Sharon. It was fantastic. We queued up outside the town theater for hours to get tickets because we didn't want to miss the show. 
We had quite good seats. We could see everything on the stage. The band were brilliant. I mean, I knew they would be. I've got all the CDs and videos. But this was the first time I'd seen them live. And, well, it was out of this world. KD, the lead singer, was just so good. They played all their hits and some new songs too. Best night of my life to tell you the truth. 2. Well, most Saturdays I just stay at home. Sometimes my friends come round and we play Snowboarder 2000 on my PC. Or just hang out listening to CDs. But my grandpa's just had an operation, so we're driving over to Kidderminster to see him. I'm looking forward to it, actually. Grandma's so funny, and we always have a good time there. And I haven't seen them for ages. Should be fun. 3. I've got thousands, literally. I started when I was eight, and I've never stopped. So my collection's just grown and grown. Whenever I meet someone, I mean whenever, at school, on holiday, in the supermarket, wherever it is, I get them to write something in my book and sign their name. I always carry it with me. And when the book gets full, I get another one. I've got over a hundred books, all filled with names and comments. 4. My mom and dad usually get a paper, but apart from sometimes looking to see what's on TV or looking at the cartoons, I never read it. I mean, it's just full of politics. It's so boring. No, I prefer books with some action in them. You know, where there's a group of people looking for a hidden treasure in the jungle, or someone's trapped on a desert island and has to escape. That's the kind of thing I like. 5. Yeah, I'm in a group with some school friends, and we sometimes perform at school concerts. Basically, though, we just do it for fun. It's a great way to relax, and it's really creative. My friend Sasha writes all the lyrics. She's really talented. I think she'd be a good poet, actually. Chatham plays guitar, Cynthia plays drums, and I do the vocals. I've got quite a good voice for rock and pop, even though I've never had singing lessons. I can keep to a tune, that's the main thing. And remember all the words, of course. 1. So you don't understand the English lessons. Don't worry, it happens to all of us at some time. My advice is to speak to your teacher. I'm sure she'll understand. Why don't you ask her to give you some extra practice exercises? 2. If I were you, I would simply ignore them. Don't pay them any attention and they'll soon stop. If you show them that you're annoyed, then they'll carry on doing it. 3. How about getting a part-time job? That way you could make some money and get a bit of experience. What about working as a waitress? I'm sure you could do it. 1. I've got no idea what to do. I feel very unhappy and I wonder if I should tell someone. Like a teacher, how will she feel if I do that? Do you think I should just forget it? 2. I don't know how to explain it, really. It's just that I feel a lot of pressure from my friends to be like them. They don't seem to like it if I'm a bit different. 3. It's not a huge problem, but I am a little concerned about my appearance. You know... Everyone wants to look good, and sometimes I just wonder if I'm fashionable enough. I'm not sure what clothes to buy. 4. It's awful. I know that she told someone one of my secrets, and I wonder how many other things she's told people. Can you imagine not being able to trust your best friend? 2. I don't know how to explain it, really. It's just that I feel a lot of pressure from my friends to be like them. They don't seem to like it if I'm a bit different. I like to spend time doing things by myself, like reading books or listening to music, and I refuse to give in to peer pressure. I'm not really very interested in sport or going to cafes. It can get a bit lonely, but I do have one or two close friends, like Mina. She's great. But she goes to a different school, so I don't see her as often as I would like to. And there's Jodie. She's in my class at school, but I'm really not sure whether I can trust her or not. I've seen her talking about me to some of the other girls. 
I think she's my friend, but you never know. I spoke to my teacher about being a bit lonely, and her advice was to get involved in producing the school magazine. Sounds like a good idea. I think I'll give it a try. Hello there, and welcome to another edition of Teenage Troubles, the program where teenagers just like you deal with your problems and try to come up with some solutions. This week, we've got three teenagers here in the studio with me, and they're going to be giving their advice about some of your problems. We've got Anthony from Edinburgh. Hello. Max from London. Hello. And Jessica from Ipswich. Hello. Hello to all of you. Now you've all got our first letter in front of you. This is from John, a listener in Wales, and he says, "My best friend is a girl, Sarah, and the other day I saw her taking something from another girl's bag. I didn't say anything, and she didn't see me. I've got no idea what to do. I feel very unhappy, and I wonder if I should tell someone, like a teacher." How will Sarah feel if I do that? Do you think I should just forget it? So, what do our teenagers in the studio think John should do? Anthony. Well, my advice is to speak to Sarah and let her know what you saw. Perhaps as an innocent explanation, maybe she had permission to go into the other girl's bag. Try not to jump to conclusions, and remember, you might be wrong. Just ask her about it. Thanks, Anthony. Do you agree, Jessica? Yes, I'm sure Anthony's right. Even if she did steal something, it might be because she has a problem. You should see if she needs your help. Let's move on to our next letter. It's from Paul in London, and he writes, "It's not a huge problem, but I am a little concerned about my appearance. You know, everyone wants to look good, and sometimes I just wonder if I'm fashionable enough." I'm not sure what clothes to buy. Jessica, should boys worry about how they look? Well, it's important to look your best. You should have clean hair and teeth, and make sure your clothes are clean. But I don't think anyone should worry too much about the way they look. Have a look round some fashionable shops, Paul, to see what you like. But remember that fashions change all the time. It's more important to be honest about who you are. Okay. Our final letter today is from Adriana, who lives in Torquay in Devon. Adriana writes, "My problem is with my best friend. It's awful. I know that she told someone one of my secrets, and I wonder how many other things she's told people. Can you imagine not being able to trust your best friend? I can't tell her anything confidential. I don't know who to turn to for advice." Well, quite a serious problem, isn't it, Max? Yes, it is. It's very important to all of us that we have someone in our lives who we can trust. My advice would be to think very carefully about it. Are you sure she told someone one of your secrets? Is it possible that it could be a misunderstanding? Make sure of that before you do anything. Then, what about telling her how you feel? Maybe she did it because she thinks you don't care anymore. Well, that's all we've got time for today. Thanks to my guests in the studio, and I hope we've been some help. I'll be back with teenage troubles and three more studio guests tomorrow. So it's goodbye from the studio. Goodbye. goodbye. And it's goodbye from me. Goodbye. <laughs> One. What has a head and a foot but no arms? A bed. Two. What's the hardest thing about skydiving? The ground. Three. Which word do you break when you say it? Silence. Four. What gets bigger and bigger the more you take away from it? A hole.
five. What does Tarzan sing at Christmas? Jungle bells. Six. What has a mouth but never talks and always runs but never walks? A river. Seven. Who do people always take their hats off to? The hairdresser. Eight. What always falls without getting hurt? Rain. Nine. Which word is always pronounced incorrectly? The word incorrectly. Ten. What has no beginning, no end, and nothing in the middle? A donut. One. Why don't traffic lights go swimming? Because they take too long to change. Two. Which is the fastest, cold or heat? Heat, because you can catch a cold. Three. Who was bigger, Mister Bigger or his son? His son. He was a little bigger. Four. Does your shirt have holes in it? No. No. Then how do you put it on? Five. Why did the traffic lights turn red? Because they had to change in the middle of the street. Six. What starts with a P, ends with an E, and has a million letters in it? The post office. Seven. What do Alexander the Great and Kermit the Frog have in common? The same middle name. Eight. What can a whole orange do that half an orange can never do? Look round. Right, well, I heard this joke the other day, and it's a bit silly, but it made me laugh. So here goes. Well, there are three hunters in the mountains: Bill, Bob, and Ben. And one day they meet up to see what they've caught. And Bill's caught a bear, a big brown bear. So Bob and Ben say, "How did you catch that?" And Bill says, "I just followed the tracks and I caught it." And then, of course, the bear escaped because these hunters weren't very clever. The next day, they meet up again. Bob's got a rabbit, a big brown rabbit. So Bill and Ben say to him, "How did you catch that?" And Bob says, "Well, I just followed the tracks and I caught it." Then the rabbit escaped because the hunters weren't very clever. The next day, they meet again. Ben is badly injured. He's got a huge cut on his head, and he's bleeding a lot. Bill and Bob say to him, "What happened to you?" And Ben says, "Well, I saw this big duck, and I just followed the tracks like you did, and I got hit by a train." Hello, Tiffany. Hi, it's me, Ryan. Oh, hi. Are we still meeting at five? Yes, of course. I just wanted to check a couple of things with you. What's your weight at the moment? Um, sixty-three kilos. Are you working on the new diet? Yes, I am. The exercises you're doing are great, but I want you to start eating more red meat. We need to build up those muscles if you're going to do well in the competition next week. Okay, red meat. Got it. Anything else? No, I don't think so. Oh, don't forget your trainers this time. I'm not lending you a pair again. I won't. See you later then. At five, yes. Bye.
One. Could I ask you how you prepared for today's race? Well, a lot of practice, hard work, really, and I've made some changes to my diet. What kind of changes? Well, I don't want to go into detail because it might help those I compete against, but it's a kind of high protein diet. I personally have followed your career quite closely, and it seems to me that we're seeing a new Tiffany Wesley this year. Well, I don't know about that, but I do know that everyone's put in a lot of hard work. That's what it takes these days to keep up with the other girls. I know you'll be anxious to get off to celebrate with your coach now. Thanks so much, Tiffany. Thank you. Two. Tiffany! Tiffany! Could I have an autograph? Of course! Who is it for? Just put, for Sally. That's me. Thanks. I thought you were great in that race. You deserve to win. Thanks, Sally. Oh, yes. I think you're improving all the time. When I saw you in Munich last month, I thought you looked really strong. Oh! Were you there? Of course I was. I'm your biggest fan. I always watch your races if I can. Good luck next week, Tiffany. Thanks a lot. Three. And we went out after the race to a restaurant for something to eat. I'm on this red meat diet, which was great because it meant that I could have a really nice steak. Sounds lovely. Wish I'd been there. It's not like that for me. Oh? Well, in long distance races, like the 10,000 meters, you need a different kind of muscle, you see. You need a lot of stamina, not the kind of sudden explosion that you need. Right. The way you talk about those long races, you make them sound so easy. I could never keep going for that long. Any further than 200 metres and I'm exhausted. I know. I've beaten you in the 400 metres, remember? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, tell me more about this race. What was it like to win? And now for today's sport. It's been a real day of ups and downs on the pitches and courts across the country. Tennis first, and the Tina Bennett scandal continues. Bennett failed a drugs test two months ago, and doctors believe that her coach must have known about it. Here's what Nirmali Patel, the woman responsible for Bennett's training, had to say to reporters earlier this afternoon. This suggestion is ridiculous, and I completely deny it. I have never, at any time, helped any of my athletes to win by illegal means. I shall be demanding a complete apology from those who have repeated these comments. This seems to be a problem that is growing in sport, and one that carries many risks. I spoke to Dr Peter Davis of the Sports Medical Council about the problem. What many young athletes don't realise is that drugs that improve your performance, apart from being illegal, can also be very bad for your health. This is a very serious matter and we will be presenting our evidence later today. Now let's turn our attention to ice skating. And there was an incredible result in the European Junior Championship today when Oliver Carter and Cicely Green, competitors in the pair's figure skating, took the gold medal with perfect sixes from every single judge. It's the first time the championship has been won with a perfect score. John Adams finds out more. It's the stuff that dreams are made of. Last year, the young couple from Lincoln came a disappointing seventh. They changed their coach, gave up their jobs as a policeman and a nurse to concentrate on skating, and today was the result. Their faultless performance had the crowd on its feet as soon as the music stopped. There was never any doubt that Carter and Green would win. The only question was by how much. I spoke to Chloe Howard, one of the people who awarded the British pair their perfect sixes. What we're looking for out there on the ice is power, control and emotion. These two were just perfectly suited to each other. Most of us don't give perfect scores very easily, but they really didn't put a foot wrong. 
None of us will ever see a routine danced as perfectly as that one was. Absolutely marvelous. So they'll be celebrating in Lincoln tonight. Back to you in the studio, Michael. Thank you, John. That's all from the sports desk. Yes, German. Well, I don't have any certificates or anything. I haven't passed any exams to prove it. But I don't think that's very important. I think what's important is being able to communicate in the language and use it when I'm there on holiday. It just makes life a lot easier to be able to speak to the local people. Thirty seconds to go, and the category is communication. Next question: Who invented the telephone? Mary. Was it Thomas Edison? No, it wasn't. John. Alexander Graham Bell. Correct. In Morse code, which letter is dot dot dot? S. Correct, John. What is Braille? Mary. A kind of writing. Well, writing for the blind. Yes, I'll give it to you. What word do the Americans use for a mobile phone? What word do the Americans? Yes, John. I'm not sure. Car phone. No, it's not car phone. Mary, any ideas? Um, card phone. No, it's cell phone. Never mind. What number do you dial in the UK? To get the emergency services, Mary. Nine one one. No, um, that's America. I mean, one one nine. I'm sorry, I have to take your first answer, Mary. The correct answer was actually nine nine nine. What was first used to send a letter in? John. A horse. No, not a horse, Mary. You can have the whole question. What was first used to send a letter in Britain in 1840? Um. I'll have to hurry you, Mary. A stamp. A stamp is correct, and there's the signal, which means that we're out of time. And looking at the scores, we can see that John's got 17, but our winner tonight with 22 points is Mary. Hello and welcome to Time Travelers, the program where we go back in time to talk to great people from the past and learn all about their lives and the reasons why they've become well known. Of course, we can't really speak to those people, but our actors bring them to life for us. I'm Jenny Turner, and for the next five weeks, we'll be talking to famous people from history about their work and themselves. In the weeks ahead, I'll be talking to Socrates, Napoleon, and Queen Elizabeth I. But this week, we're talking about telephones. Did you know that there are about a billion phone lines in the world? That's right. The USA is the country with the most phone lines, about two hundred million. But Greece, with around six million, and the UK, with around thirty-six million. Still have more than one phone line for every two people. Of course, there are still some countries in the world where a phone is an expensive luxury, but for most of us in Europe, the phone has become part of our everyday world, and it all started with the work of one man. I'd like to welcome Alexander Graham Bell to the show. Alexander Graham Bell, inventor of the telephone. Welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be here, Jenny. I'd like to start by asking you about yourself. When were you born? I was born in 1847, and although we moved around quite a bit as I grew up, and I spent a lot of time in the USA and in Canada, I always loved my hometown of Edinburgh in Scotland. Were any members of your family inventors? Ah,、uh, no, not really. My father was an actor, and he was interested in helping people who had problems with speaking. Although he never invented anything, 
His wife, my mother, was deaf, and I was always interested in helping her. So I eventually became a teacher of the deaf. Really? Yes, that's how I met my wife. She was one of the deaf students I taught to speak. I became very interested in problems of communication. Such as? Well, at that time, in the middle of the 19th century, the only way you could communicate over long distances was by telegraph. That had been invented in 1843. The problem was that one wire could only carry one message. I wanted to find a way for it to carry many messages so that people could communicate much faster. I see. And were you successful? No, but it was while I was working on that that I realized it was possible to send the human voice over a wire. When was that? The first phone call was made from my laboratory to the next room on March the 10th, 1876. And what were the first words ever spoken by telephone? My assistant, Mr. Watson, was in the next room, and I said, Watson, come here. I want to see you. The next thing I knew, he came running into the room with a look of amazement on his face. It really was very funny. And how did you feel at that moment? I was happy and proud, because I knew that it was an invention that would change the world in many ways. I showed my invention to other scientists, and I became very famous and very rich very quickly. Well, the telephone certainly has changed the world. Alexander Graham Bell, thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you. That's all from Time Traveller this week. Next week, we'll be asking Socrates about life in ancient Athens. Goodbye. Right, so these are the final two candidates, are they? Yes, Sandra and Steve. Which one do you prefer? Well, Steve's got more experience than Sandra. I think he's probably the best one. What do you think? I don't agree, actually. Uh, he does have more experience, but that's experience working as an editor, not as a reporter. Sandra's got a degree in journalism. Steve hasn't. And she's worked as a reporter. I think she's the best candidate. Yes, I suppose Steve's degree in French isn't very useful, is it? OK, shall we offer the job to Sandra? I think that's probably the best decision, isn't it? Yes, I think it probably is. One. This week, it's from the railway station to the town centre and back again. I actually really enjoy it, although it's a bit annoying when you get stuck in traffic and all the passengers start blaming you. Two. You know, one day you're in London for a cricket match or something, the, the next you're going halfway around the world for the Olympics, then a few weeks later it's a football match in Swindon. Three. I'm actually in the classroom for about 24 hours a week, but of course there's also a lot of lesson preparation and marking to do, so it's a tiring job. Four. I spend most of the day saying things like, Can I help you? That's £3.50, please. Here's your receipt. And shall I put that in a bag for you? Five. You therefore have to listen to the evidence very carefully before reaching your verdict, your decision. I do have to send people to prison sometimes, of course, so it's a huge responsibility. Six. You've got to make it fun to put people in a good mood, but also give them the news, weather and traffic information that they need first thing. Of course, you've got to play lots of good music, too. One. Well, yes, you do get to meet a lot of different people, but you don't exactly have interesting conversations with them. I spend most of the day saying things like, Can I help you? That's £3.50, please. Here's your receipt. And shall I put that in a bag for you? It's not the most interesting job in the world, I can tell you. I get there at about half past seven in the morning, and the first customers are waiting to come in when we open the doors at eight. I suppose I do do a few different things at work. I work on the till... I help customers choose the right things. 
and I deal with complaints if any of our products don't work properly. It's a long day, though. I don't get home until seven at night usually, and I have to work on Saturdays. Two. I do the same route every day for a week, and then we change. This week, it's from the railway station to the town centre and back again. I actually really enjoy it, although it's a bit annoying when you get stuck in traffic and all the passengers start blaming you. I mean, there's nothing I can do about that, is there? It used to be more difficult because, as well as driving, we also had to sell tickets when people got on. These days, though, they buy tickets from a newsagent's or wherever, and just punch them in a machine when they get on. So we don't have to worry about giving the right change or anything like that. Three. Well, I do the weekday breakfast show, which means getting up at half past four in the morning to get to the studio for six. Then I'm on air until ten. It's a great show to do, as you know. You're the first thing that millions of people hear when they wake up in the morning. You've got to make it fun to put people in a good mood, but also give them the news, weather, and traffic information that they need first thing. Of course, you've got to play lots of good music too. You're definitely not allowed to sound tired or in a bad mood. That's perhaps the most difficult thing. You've always got to sound so happy. <laughs> Four. For me, it's the best job in the world. I can't imagine doing anything else. You're in a different place every day. You know, one day you're in London for a cricket match or something. The, the next you're going halfway round the world for the Olympics. Then a few weeks later, it's a football match in Swindon. I'm self-employed, so my work really starts after I've taken the pictures. I rush back to the dark room, develop the photos, and then send them to newspapers and magazines to see who wants to buy them. It's such a great feeling when you see a picture you took in the paper the next day. Five. I'm actually in the classroom for about twenty-four hours a week, but of course there's also a lot of lesson preparation and marking to do, so it's a tiring job. The students make it all worthwhile, though. It's wonderful watching them learn and feeling you're helping to educate them. Some kids do cause trouble or are rude or just lazy, but most of them are really kind, polite, bright, interesting, and interested youngsters. I think they're going to be great adults when they're older. Six. I have a little office behind my courtroom where I go when we're not actually having a trial. I usually work from about eight in the morning till mm, five or six at night. What I particularly like about this job is that each case is different. You may have the same crime again and again, but each actual case, and of course each defendant, is different. You therefore have to listen to the evidence very carefully before reaching your verdict, your decision. I do have to send people to prison sometimes, of course, so it's a huge responsibility. One. Well, you don't need a degree or anything like that for this job. I can tell you. I mean, really, you actually don't need any qualifications at all. Skills are a different matter, though. You've got to be good at dealing with people, always be polite and friendly, never get annoyed, that sort of thing. You've also got to look clean and smart, and generally just be a helpful person, I suppose. Two. The most important thing is that you have a license to drive a public bus. However good at driving you are, if you don't have the license, you won't get the job, and you get the license by taking a driving test. But it's a little bit more difficult than the test for driving a car. I personally think you have to be polite and friendly, although I do know a few other bus drivers who wouldn't agree. What else? You used to have to be quite good at maths because, as I said. We had to give change, but you don't really need that any more. Three. Qualifications? None. You can leave school with nothing at the age of sixteen and still become a DJ. That's the beauty of it. 
To get a show like mine on national radio, you need to have lots and lots of experience, probably starting in local radio. You've got to have a good, clear, friendly voice, and of course, to love music. And you've got to have a lot of luck. How you look doesn't make any difference, thank goodness. That's what I love about the radio. Four. Well, I suppose it helps if you've studied photography at university or college, but I do know some great photographers who've never really studied it. It's more important that you've got a very good sense of what makes a good picture, and that comes really from experience. It's also a natural talent, though, I think. Some people will never make good photographers, however much they study or practice. For my job, you've also got to love traveling. And because I run my own business, you've got to be organized and quite good at maths. Five. Yes, you've got to have a university degree and also a teaching qualification. You see, it's not just about how much you know about the subject, it's also how well you can teach it to other people. They're actually quite different things. You've got to like children, of course, and you've got to be enthusiastic. If you're not enthusiastic, then the kids are just going to get bored, aren't they? You've also got to be happy not earning a lot of money. <laughs> Six. Yes, well, you can't really become a judge without having been a lawyer for a long time beforehand. And to become a lawyer, you really need to do a law degree at university. So, yes, there's a lot of work to do before you can become a judge. I think you have to be very logical and analytical, and of course, fair. You've got to have very good listening skills, too. Hello, reception. Could I speak to the hotel manager, please? I'd like to make a complaint about our hotel room.、Uh, yes, sir, this is the manager. What seems to be the problem? Well, for a start, there are no towels in the bathroom.、Uh, I'm sorry, sir. I'll send some up straight away. And another thing, I couldn't sleep because of the noise last night. Oh, unfortunately, that was some building work that had to be done, sir. It should be quiet from now on.、Uh, was there anything else? Yes, there is one more thing. I can't find the remote control for the air conditioning. I'll send a porter up right away, sir. Thank you for letting us know. Yes, well, thank you. Goodbye. One. It was a camping holiday, so we spent two weeks in tents, which was okay, I suppose. Tanya enjoyed it more than I did. The beaches were great, though, and it was worth it just to work on my suntan. The local restaurants were quite cheap, although I wasn't too sure about the food, to be honest. Two. It was very warm for the time of year. Too warm, I'd say. We didn't really do much sightseeing because we were just so tired from the heat. We spent some time in a small art gallery, and it was nice to get out of the warm weather and see a bit of local culture at the same time. It wasn't long before it was time to go back to the hotel, where the air conditioning wasn't even working. Three. It was a really good holiday. Amazing Adventures, the company's called, and they arrange these adventure holidays. Horse riding, swimming, rock climbing, everything really. I wasn't so confident on the horses because I'd never done it before, and I'll think twice before doing it again. Swimming wasn't so interesting because I can do that at home. Getting up a rock without any help and then looking down with a real sense of achievement, that's what I really wanted to do more of. Four. We were expecting to get there and face problems with transport, and it was true for the trains. No seats, and they were really dirty. It was the buses that surprised us. They were on time, and the tickets were so cheap, not like the plane. We spent a fortune getting there, and the meal they gave us was terrible. Tonight on The Travel Show, we'll be looking at holiday nightmares. Those times when nothing seems to go right. Whether it's your travel agent losing the tickets or your hotel not being finished, there are a thousand and one things that can go wrong on holiday. 
With me in the studio to discuss this is Sarah Turner from World Travel, the travel agents. Sarah, welcome. Hello. Now, is it really that bad when things go wrong on holiday? Oh yes. When you think that some people have saved money all year to go on holiday, it can be a real disappointment when things go wrong. Yes, I can imagine. Now, what kinds of things can go wrong on holiday? Well, a good rule to follow is that if it can go wrong, it probably will. Probably the single biggest category of problems is problems with the hotel. It's not finished, or it's dirty, or it's not as nice as the brochure said it would be. Do you find that tourists have problems with the food, the local people, the language, even? Oh yes, quite often. The food, especially. When people aren't used to it, then some foreign food can cause problems. If it's very spicy, for example, we don't get so many complaints about the people. Most people welcome tourists and are quite friendly. We did have one woman from London who went to Spain, and when she got back, she complained that all the locals spoke Spanish, which was quite funny. I don't really know what she expected. Is there anything people can do if they have problems on holiday? If you booked the holiday yourself, then there is not much you can do, I'm afraid, except not go there again. If you booked through a travel agent, then the most important thing is to put everything in writing. Send a letter to the Association of British Travel Agents, or ABTA for short, explaining the situation, and they'll help you take legal action. Sarah Turner, thanks for joining me today. My pleasure. Well, both these pictures show people in successful situations. In picture A, the audience is clapping the rock group, so their performance has probably been a success. The performers look happy. Picture B is a picture of someone getting a degree or diploma or something, so they must have done well in their exams. I suppose the main difference between the pictures is that the second one is an example of academic success, whereas the first picture shows success in a performance. Another difference is that in picture A, a group of people have been successful together. In picture B, the person has been successful on their own. One. Okay, I I've done that. What next? Okay, right.、Uh, can you chop the mushrooms and the carrots and turn the cooker down a bit? And when you've done that, do a bit of washing up and get the plates out. Is that all? Yes, for now. Oh, look at the time. They'll be here soon. We'll never be ready in time. Oh dear.、Um, can you also stir the soup then while I quickly go and change? Hold on. I can't do all that on my own. I've got to get ready too, you know. I'll be really quick. I promise. Look, forget the washing up and just concentrate on the cooking. Okay? I'll do the washing up later.、Uh, okay, but please hurry. You know I don't feel very confident in the kitchen on my own. I don't want to ruin everything. You won't. You'll be fine. Just cut up the carrots and mushrooms, turn the oven down, and I'll be back before you know it. Two. I don't know. I don't know what he likes. Well, he is your dad. What does he like doing in his spare time? Nothing much. He just watches TV usually. Maybe he'd like a subscription to a TV magazine then. Or what about a nice pair of slippers to wear while he's watching TV? No, I don't think so. Well, maybe. I don't know. I think he's got some slippers. Oh, actually, I'm not sure. Let's keep on looking for a bit. What do you think about these slippers? Do you think he'll like them? Oh yeah, they're great. I can definitely see him wearing them. Do you know what size he takes? You don't want to get ones that are too big. No, I don't. But these look about right, don't they? I think I'll get them. I'm sure he'll like them. Three. So, what are we going to need? Well, balloons, of course, lots of balloons. 
Some soft drinks like lemonade and stuff. What else? We can use your stereo, can't we? I think between us we've got enough music, haven't we? Oh, I think so. Now, what about food? Shall we cook or... It'd be easier just to order pizza, wouldn't it? And everyone likes pizza. Yeah, I think that's better, isn't it? Oh, it's going to be great, isn't it? Of course it is, and I think it's going to be easier to organize than we thought. Yeah, we'll be finished in no time. Do you know what we've forgotten? What? The invitations. You've got to have invitations. What are we going to do? Well, we can make some, can't we? It shouldn't take long. Okay, but let's work out first who we're planning to invite, so we know how many invitations to make, okay? Right. So there's Barry, Jen and Sylvie, Dave and Alex, Angela and Debbie. Who else? Your brother Adam and his friend Pip. I think we should be writing these down, shouldn't we? Four. Hello? Uh, hello, Mr. Carter. It's uh, Sam Delaney here. Hello, Sam. What can I do for you? Well, uh, I'm afraid I'm not able to uh, come in on Tuesday as we'd arranged, so uh, I was uh, wondering whether we could rearrange. Right. Let me just look at my schedule. How does Thursday at five o'clock suit you? Uh, well, actually... Oh, I see. Well, how about Friday at 11? So, that's Friday at 11 then, Sam? Yes, uh, there is uh, just one other thing, Mr. Carter. Yes? What's that? Well, uh, I'm afraid our company has had to increase its prices a little, uh, so uh, the prices I sent you last week are not the right prices, and... Uh... Well, that's changed everything, to be honest. I wish you'd told me that before. I think you'd better fax me the new prices immediately, and I'll call you if I think we should still meet up. As far as I'm concerned, I may well have to go elsewhere. Five. So, we've got... I love you in the summer, I love you all the time. We'll always stay together, you will always be mine. That sounds quite good, doesn't it? Yeah, that's not bad at all. But what comes next? What about... I know that you will love me when we are old and grey. I know that I will love you until my dying day. We can work out the tune later. Oh, we've done it wrong, haven't we? We should have worked out the tune first. How stupid of us. I think we should start again. I don't think we have to. Of course we do. I know much more about this than you do, you know. Wait a minute. You can't rhyme kiss for the leap. Firstly, they're completely different sounds. And secondly, they just sound stupid together. I'm not rhyming them with each other. Kiss rhymes with miss. And leap rhymes with deep. Well, it still sounds stupid to me. It doesn't. I think it sounds very good. But what do you know about writing songs? Six. So, just remind me, what happens if I land here? Well, it depends. If you've got a get-out-of-jail card, you just use your card and carry on when it's your turn again. If you haven't, you can either pay some money or try to throw a double. I'm sure that's not how we played it last time. Yes, it is. Don't you remember? You have to put the money in the middle of the board and someone takes it if they land on free parking. Are you sure about that? I'm positive. We always play like that, honestly. Oh, no! What? Well, if I get a three or a seven, I'm going to land on your property. And you've got hotels on them. And the rent's enormous. Oh, anything but a three or a seven. Three, yes. I knew it. Typical. Oh, go on, then. How much do I owe you? Speaker one. Well, if you're a film buff like I am, there's really no alternative. I mean, of course, watching films at home is more convenient sometimes, but you lose so much of the atmosphere on the small screen. And little local cinemas do have a certain charm, and they may well be cheaper, in fact, but, you know, the sound quality and picture quality usually just aren't good enough. No, you've got to have a choice of movie, a comfortable environment, a big screen and top quality projection if you're really going to get the best out of the whole viewing experience. Speaker 2 When you're quite a large family, like we are, you really have to think about the expense. And taking the kids to the pictures is just too costly these days. 
So we generally just pop down to Darcy's on Saturday morning and let the kids choose a couple of tapes. They actually have a lot more choice that way, and as I said, it's a lot cheaper. And they're quite happy just sitting in front of the TV for a couple of hours anyway. Speaker three. The thing is, for me, I'll watch anything. See, you know, classic Oscar-winning movie or complete rubbish. I just don't care. So it's easy just to turn on the box and watch whatever's on. I'm actually not very good at making decisions, so I let the program schedulers do it for me. If I had to choose a video or see what's on at the local cinema, well, then I have to make a decision, wouldn't I? Speaker four. If it's a choice between watching a movie on video or at the cinema, then there's no contest. The cinema wins every time. But to tell you the truth, Barry and I don't really go to the movies any more. The telly's digital, and Barry's connected it up to the PC. So we've got a kind of home entertainment system. It's fab. The quality's great, as you'd expect. But what I really like is the control you have. You know, 'cause it's all on disc. It's all interactive. And some of the most recent releases even let you choose the ending. No, I could never go back to video now. Speaker five. Well, a film's a film if you ask me, and if it's any good, it doesn't really matter where you see it. But I have to admit, there's something special about watching a film under the stars on a summer's evening. Reminds me of that movie, Cinema Paradiso. And you've got a table, so you can have something to eat and drink if you get packaged during the film. Lovely. Speaker one. Yes, it's actually not the kind of film I usually like, but I have to say it was done rather well. I guess because it wasn't all special effects. There was actually some plot and characterisation too, and the robots were really very funny and sweet. And they did provide some comic relief from the big planetary battle scenes. No, could have been a lot worse. Speaker two. Oh, it was adorable. I think we enjoyed it more than the kids did. It was about this little toy cowboy who feels threatened when his owner, you know, a little boy, gets a new robot thing for Christmas. The animation was fantastic. It really did look real. Still, I don't think they draw them by hand these days, do they? It's all done by computer. Speaker three. Yeah, it was some kind of sentimental rubbish about a policeman who falls in love with a bank clerk who he meets after a robbery. Typical stuff. They move in together, split up, get back together. Bit boring, really, to tell you the truth. Speaker four. Well, it was Barry's choice, and I thought, oh no, what's he gone and got this time? But it was actually really rather fun. Loads of car chases and people doing impossible things, like jumping from one building to the next. And the scene in the cable car at the end was, well, I was literally on the edge of my seat. No, very good. Speaker five. Return of the Vampire it was called, or something like that. Made in 1964, but still quite scary. About an aristocrat who's actually the grandson of Count Dracula, living in London. Loads of blood, and of course they get him in the end, but not bad at all, really. Hello, and welcome to another episode of What Do They Do? Today I'm joined in the studio by Bill Peters, who's a stuntman. Bill, what do stuntmen actually do? Well, it's quite simple, really. If there are scenes in a movie that are too dangerous for the actors to do, you know, like jumping onto a train or diving off a cliff, then we do them. So you often have to put yourself in danger, then. Well, things can go wrong, of course, but it's not as bad as people think. We're very careful to make sure the stunt is safe. For example, I'm working on the new James Bond movie at the moment. And in one of the scenes, James Bond is attacked by a crocodile. I actually did that scene, and although the crocodile was real, wasn't plastic or anything like that, it had a mask over its mouth, so it couldn't bite me when I was wrestling with it. The scene looks great, but I wasn't in any real danger. So, what's your typical day like? Well, one of the great things about being a stuntman is that every time you go to work, you're doing something different. You know, one week I might be filming on location in the desert. The next, I might be doing underwater scenes off the coast of Italy. You never know. But actually, I only work for about twenty weeks a year. The rest of the time, I spend with a family. I've got two young daughters, and it's lovely to have the time to watch them grow up.
How does someone become a stuntman? Well, you don't need any qualifications or anything like that. You don't have to study stunt work at university. But having said that, more and more stuntmen but, and women. Let's not forget, lots of the people in my profession are women. More and more stuntmen do actually get into the profession by going on short courses. These are run by professionals, and they teach you how to fall without hurting yourself, safety techniques, and things like that. When I started ooh, over 15 years ago now, those kind of courses didn't really exist. I was a professional diver and got a call from a producer who was shooting a movie about a shipwreck with lots of underwater scenes and needed some help. I had so much fun, I decided to become a full-time stuntman. Best decision I ever made. Bill Peters, thank you very much for joining us today. One. Thanks for coming in today, Mr. Runkin. It's about Sammy. Is anything wrong? Well, to tell you the truth, we're all a little concerned about Sammy's attitude in class. He doesn't seem to be paying as much attention as he used to, and I've even had reports that he's beginning to be rude to some of the teachers. I see. Oh dear. Two. And you'll see from this slide here. That pottery from the Minoan civilization was clearly influenced by the Minoans' trade with Egypt and the Middle East. Right? Could we have the lights back on, please? Okay. So the question we have to address is whether the Minoans were in fact. Three. Do you know? I've got about two hundred essays to mark over the weekend. Me too. I mean. I don't mind. I know it's part of the job and all that, but but the kids don't seem to understand, do they? They're always saying, "Have you marked my essay yet? Have you marked my essay yet?" As if we only had one to mark. I know. Still, at least they're keen. Four. You finished your homework yet? Yeah, I finished. Can I go round Tommy's now for a bit? All right, love. Don't be late though. I want you in bed by half nine. Okay. See you later. Bye, love. Five, and we'll need three grey shirts too. Have you got any small ones in stock? I'll just have a look for you. You did say small, didn't you? Yes, that's right. Here we go. Three small ones. Six. Right. I'd like you all to turn to page thirty-six, please. Now, Amy, I'd like you to. Sean, are you chewing gum? How many times have I told you I won't allow gum in my classroom? Take it out now, please. In the bin. Seven. You're doing very well. That's it. Watch your speedometer. Good. I think I'm getting the hang of it at last. Yup. You'll be ready for your test soon. Right. Now get ready to turn left at the next junction. That's right. Start indicating. Good. Reduce your speed. Mr. Taylor, he was called. Taught us English in the sixth form. He was a scream. He used to do these impersonations of the other teachers. Brilliant, it was. Had us rolling around on the floor. The best one he did was of the headmistress. She was really strict, and he used to come into the class waddling, as she used to do, and say. Mr. Taylor can't be here today, so I'm taking the class. Sit down, shut up, and don't make a sound for the next hour. Got her off to a T. Hysterical. Well, usually at my school we were called by our surnames by the teachers. You know, Williams, where's your homework? Or Williams, stop running. But there was one teacher, Miss Granger, who insisted on calling us Mister or Miss, so it would be. Mr. Williams, please don't be late again. Or not bad, Miss Farley. Quite encouraging, in fact. You know, it really made a difference. We all felt she was treating us like adults rather than small children. Of course, my parents split up when I was in the fourth form, so things weren't exactly easy for me for a while, and my schoolwork did start to suffer.
Mr. Potter, though the headmaster, was really understanding, and he'd often call me into his office and ask if everything was okay and if he could help in any way. I'll never forget him. Actually, his lessons were really boring, but he was kind to me. Well, I was rubbish at maths. I mean, really useless. I'd never even got the hang of multiplication and division, and most of my maths teachers had just given up on me. But there was this one teacher. Mrs. Walker, her name was, who I had for maths in the fifth year. Anne, she used to say, "Anne, you can do it. I know you can do it. You've just got to believe in yourself." She gave me the confidence I'd been lacking all those years. And look at me now: pass my exams, maths at university, and now a well-paid accountant. I owe everything to her, you know. We used to have this thing called the plus and minus system. You know, if you did something good or if you did well in a test or something, the teacher would give you a plus. But if you did anything bad, you'd get a minus. Well, one teacher, Mr. Barker, really liked our class, and he used to give us loads of pluses. It was bizarre. You know, he'd hand the homework back, and at the bottom it would say "very well done," and there'd be like five pluses. All the other teachers only ever gave one or maybe two if you'd done something really special. Sorry, guys. Staff meeting went on a bit longer than it should have. Now, as you know, we're continuing to look at the European novel throughout this term, and I asked you last week to think about what you particularly want to concentrate on for your first assessed essay. Erica, have you had any thoughts on this? Um. Well, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure yet, as I um haven't actually. You have got all the books on this term's reading list, haven't you? Didn't you read them over the summer? Well, you see, the thing is, I was working over the summer, and I have got the books. But let's say I've got rather a lot of reading to do over the next week or so. But I'll get it done. I promise. Well, you really must. Paul, how about you? Have you got any ideas? Yes, I'm toying with the idea of comparing Anna Karenina and Madame Bovary in terms of their destruction through love. Would it be all right if I actually looked at two texts like that? I don't suppose I could do a comparison between a novel and a film, could I? I mean, a novel and a film version of the same novel. I'd rather you didn't, to be honest, Erica, as I don't really want to get into looking at film on this course. Oh, right. But your idea, Paul, is rather a good choice for an essay, actually. I seem to remember I did something similar when I was an undergraduate. What I would like is to see a plan for both your essays by the thirteenth of next month, if that's okay with you. Oh, actually, I thought we had until the thirtieth, but、uh, never mind. I'm sure I'll be ready in time. Would you mind if I brought my plan along next Tuesday, as I won't be around in the week leading up to the thirteenth? I'll be on that Shakespeare week in Stratford. Yes, no problem. Bring it along when you come next week. Speaker one. When you see her on TV, I don't think you get such a good idea of what she's like live. I saw her about two years ago in concert, and she was—well, I don't know how to describe it really. I'd heard a couple of her hits before, and I thought it was nothing special. How wrong I was! I never realised that she was such a good dancer. By the time she'd done a couple of songs, I was tapping my feet and singing along. In the end, I had a great time. Speaker two, I was one of the people who bought her very first CDs before she became so big. She used to have a really jazzy style, and I liked that. After a few albums, though, she started to sound more like a rock star. A lot of people felt let down, me included. It wasn't that it was so bad, but it just wasn't the same. I haven't even heard her last album. Maybe I should give it a go. Speaker three, there was a program on TV about her the other night. It was about how she came from such a poor family. They were saying that she'd worked really hard to get where she is today. I don't know though. From what I saw, it looked more like good luck than hard work. We could all be famous if we had that kind of luck. Lots of us have talent, but we don't meet the right people like she did. Speaker four. I've always liked her music, 
I've got all her CDs, and I sometimes have them playing here in the shop while I'm working. Of course, everybody knows that she was born in this town. I went to the same school as she did, but not at the same time. She's really made this town famous, which has been good for business. I think we should all thank her for promoting tourism in this area. They're thinking of building a museum about her in the town center. I'll be one of the first visitors. Speaker one. Oh hi, Lisa. Greg here. It's Thursday afternoon. Hope everything's okay. I guess you're still at work. How's the new job going? Are you still enjoying it? I really wanted to check that you got the email I'd sent. It's about the party next week. You'll see when you get home. Call me later. I'll be here until about ten. Bye. Speaker two. This is Maria, and it's Thursday evening. Where are you? I've been trying to get in touch with you all day. What's wrong with your mobile? I must have called a dozen times. The thing is that I'm not going to be able to come to the party after all. I'll explain when I see you, but it's all very exciting. Call me when you get in if it's not too late. Bye. Oh, how was dinner with James? Bye. Speaker three. Mrs. Turner, this is Sandra from the hairdressers, Curlies. I spoke to you on Tuesday when you called. The reason I'm calling is you had an appointment for nine tomorrow. I'm afraid something has come up, and we're going to have to rearrange. I'm sorry, but could you come in at midday? I'll call again in the morning unless I hear from you. I hope it's not too inconvenient. Goodbye. Speaker four. Lisa, it's Mark. Oh, it's、uh, quite late on Thursday night. Did you say you were going out somewhere to dinner tonight, or was that tomorrow? To get to the point, I've invited someone to the party, but I've forgotten the number of the house. Stupid, I know, but I can't help it. Where are you going to be tomorrow? Call me or send me an email to let me know so I can pass it on to him. Thanks. Bye. So, Lisa, did you have a good time when you went out for dinner with James? Oh yes. My social life is really improving. He was really nice, so I'm glad we went out together. We went to a great little restaurant. I had loads of messages on my answering machine when I got in, though. Yeah, who were they from? Well, Greg called to see if I'd got his email. It was something about him not being able to come to the party because he's meeting some other friends. A bit irritating, actually, because he missed my last party as well. I don't know why I keep inviting him. And then there was one from Maria saying that she wasn't coming either. It was because of a chance she's got to visit her aunt in America, which she thought was exciting. I wish I was going. I told her, and she said that maybe I could go with her next time. Anything else? One of the assistants from the hairdressers called to change my appointment. I was furious because that's the second time they've done it to me. I called them and told them what I thought of them. The manager was very apologetic, but it's just not good enough. That was all I think. Oh wait, I did have a call from Mark saying that he'd invited someone to the party. That's not a problem, is it? Of course not. The thing was that he couldn't remember the number of the house. Honestly, he's so forgetful. He does make me laugh. It would really worry me if I kept forgetting things like he does. Anyway, I sent him an email. So hopefully he won't get lost. What about you? What did you do last night? One. So I heard there was a bit of a problem last week. Yeah, just a bit. You know the report that Mr. Granger wanted. Well, Monday morning came around and I couldn't find it anywhere. Oh no! Yeah, and I really didn't want to let him down. Not after last time. I looked everywhere for it. Imagine how embarrassing it would have been to go in and say, "Oh, sorry, I've lost it." I bet. It turned up in a drawer. No idea how it got there. A big sigh of relief all round, and Mr. Granger had it in his hands on time. A close thing, though. Two. Yes, it was at Tanya's place. Lovely house she has. We got there around eight. It was great. I met a man who's an accountant in Croydon. 
funny, really, because I was saying to Tanya the other day that I was thinking about doing accountancy. He was telling me about all the top people in his office and how rich and important they are. It sounded wonderful. A lot of good information about the kind of qualifications you need too. It made up my mind for me. I'm definitely going to try to find a course somewhere. Three. Mr. Harris. Yeah, it's Tony. Tony Smith. That's right, from Johnson Brothers. It's about the meeting on Thursday. Yeah. No, we've put it off long enough. I agree. It's just that I won't be able to get the figures to you before we begin. That's right. I thought that maybe I could talk you through what happened at the management focus group, so that you know what to expect. Of course. Yes, I understand. Well, first of all, let me fill you in on the European trends. Four. And our next caller is Marianne from Coventry. Hello, Ted. Hi. I listen to your show all the time. We love it. All the girls at work think you're the best. That's good to hear. What are your favourites? There's the ten o'clock teas. The problem is I can never get the answers right. Can't you have some easy questions sometime? Then maybe I'll think about having a go. Well, we'll see what we can do, Marianne. Thanks for your opinion, anyway. Who is your dedication for? It's for Jane and Barbara and all the others at Brookner Garments. Anything from the seventies. It's a pleasure, Marianne. Thanks for calling. Five. Well, I couldn't believe it. She was standing in the middle of the shop with everybody listening, saying that I'd given her the wrong size, and was I too stupid to read the label? I had a look, and it was the wrong size. It was part of the delivery that had caused all the trouble, and we'd had to send half of them back already. I just hadn't noticed that this one had been put with the others. Mr. Trent, the manager, came in and got really annoyed. It was obvious it wasn't my fault. In the end, he took the dress back and got rid of her. I don't know how people can speak to you like that. Six. Yes, tomorrow. I'll get round to it tomorrow. I promise. That's what you said last week, and it's still sitting there, making the whole street look untidy. Well, it's just a bit difficult until I fix the wheel. I don't understand what that's got to do with it. Last week you said you'd have to take it into the car wash first, but I didn't see that happen. It's just not so easy to get rid of that model. People don't want Mark Threes. You're asking too much. Drop the price a bit. You must be able to find somebody somewhere. Seven. Somebody knows it was called. It's set in London in the early nineteen hundreds, amongst the poor and the unemployed. It's not something I knew a great deal about before. It might not be the kind of thing that's going to change your life, but it was interesting. It reminded me that people like me with enough money have a responsibility. It made me a little uncomfortable, actually. I'll lend it to you if you like. Eight. Look, it'll only take five minutes. Then you can go and meet your friends. How do you think she feels living there all on her own? It's not like the phone's constantly ringing, is it? Since your grandfather died, God bless him, the only people who've been round to visit have been me and your dad and your uncle Matthew. She wrote to you last week, and the least you can do is thank her for the money she sent you. You can ask her about the visit to the doctors, and then pass her to me. You know you're her favourite grandchild. Since first coming to the attention of the public in the hit film My Previous Life, Denise Fenton has had the kind of career that most actresses can only dream of. Her marriage to Tom Norris earlier this year caught all the newspapers by surprise. The latest film, Settlers, seems certain to be a huge success. Nobody could have expected it when Denise made her first stage appearance at the age of nine in the school play, playing the part of a sheep. Teachers and friends from those days 
remember Denise as a quiet, shy girl, and if she ever mentioned any future ambitions, then they never went beyond going to university and studying to become a vet. Once she moved to London, though, Denise was exposed to the theatre in a way that hadn't been possible in the small northern town where she had grown up. She soon realised what her true talents were, and enrolled in drama school, where she met the director Peter Jones, who was a major influence on both her professional and private lives. After graduating, Peter and Denise moved out to Hollywood together, for the first three years renting a small flat above a supermarket on the outskirts of town. In interviews, they both remember those days as hard. Peter spent months trying to sell his ideas to producers, while Denise attended dozens of auditions. Both of them spent some time doing a variety of odd jobs. Peter working in a bar for a year, and Denise waiting on tables in a restaurant, to make enough money to pay the rent each month. Eventually, Peter knocked on the door of Andy Foster at Panoramic Studios, and presented him with the script to My Previous Life. Andy loved it, and was introduced to Denise. He saw immediately that she was perfect for the part of Henrietta, and production started three months later. When the film was released, it broke all box office records and shot Denise Fenton to international stardom. Speaker one. I really got a taste for it when I visited the country. Indian food relies on spices and strong flavors. There's a lot of garlic and ingredients like turmeric, cumin, and curry powder. They use a lot of vegetables like spinach and potatoes, and the meat is usually lamb or chicken. It can be quite hot and spicy, but with the climate they have over there, that's an advantage because it helps to cool you down. It's become very big in Britain, and I heard that it's even more popular these days than fish and chips. Speaker two, I've always loved pasta. For me, Italian food is all about the idea of a family. You know, the image from films of a large family around a table with a big pot of spaghetti in the middle. I love the combination of tomatoes, basil, and Parmesan cheese. I don't think we do it justice outside Italy. If they could see the pizza that we eat, well, let's just say that the best pizzas I've ever tasted. Are from the little restaurants in the centre of Rome. Speaker three. I spent about three years living in Beijing, and that's where I learned a lot about Chinese food. You'd be surprised at some of the strange ideas going around about Chinese cookery. Some people seem to think it's just dogs and snakes, but it's not like that at all. In fact, there are many different traditions that make up Chinese cuisine. Most of them are based around the idea of small pieces of meat and vegetables fried quickly and then eaten with rice or noodles. It's actually a very healthy diet. Speaker four. I don't think that we really deserve our reputation for not being able to cook properly. English food isn't all fish and chips, you know. There are other dishes that people around the world don't seem to know quite so well, like Lancashire hot pot. It's a kind of stew of potatoes and lamb, and it's really tasty. I think all countries have their own traditions, and you can always find something worth cooking if you look closely enough. Speaker five. I love Mexican food. People there often make their own tortillas, and it's really quite easy once you've got your flour. You take it when it's wet, and you shape it into flat cakes, which are round and thin. They're eaten as bread with rice, tomatoes, garlic, and chilies. You can quite easily find them these days. Although the Mexicans themselves think the shop-bought ones are a bit dry, one of my favourites is a tortilla wrapped around spicy chicken and fried onions with chili sauce. You can't beat it. Was there anything that surprised you about the food in India? I'd read a little about it before I went, so I was quite well prepared. I've also been eating curries for years in this country, so I knew more or less what to expect. 
There was a lot less meat than I thought there would be. Why do you think that was? Well, of course, the Indians generally don't eat beef for religious reasons, so most meat is lamb or chicken. Compared to the West, though, it's quite expensive for the ordinary Indian. You have to remember that many people in that country are poor, very poor by European standards. They will often eat a whole meal of rice and vegetables. Was there anything you tasted that you didn't like? I experienced some wonderful dishes from all over India, and there were some incredible tastes in every area. I think the only time I really didn't enjoy what I was eating was when it was too spicy, even for a curry lover like me. It was a little Spanish place. I told Sean to book, but he'd thought we'd be all right if we just took a chance. We got there at about nine, and it looked like we were in luck. We went in and sat down and started looking through the menu. They've got some wonderful dishes, and it wasn't as expensive as I'd heard it was. I was just making up my mind when a waiter came over and pointed to the little reserved sign on the table. They all had them. It was a bit embarrassing, actually, because we'd already started drinking the water that was there. We had to get something on the way home. Uncle Sam's, it was called. It was supposed to be a kind of quality American restaurant rather than just a burger place. I wanted to try the chili, thinking that it would be good because America is so close to Mexico. I went with Richard, and he decided to go for the Cajun chicken. They were right when they said it wasn't the same as fast food. It took three quarters of an hour to arrive. We were starving. I think we would have eaten anything by that time. In the end, we weren't disappointed. I definitely recommend it, although they're a bit slow. I don't know if that's what they're all like, because I'd never been to an Indian restaurant before. We'd reserved a table, and the waiter showed us to our seats when we arrived. They brought us a menu and recommended a few things, which was fine because we weren't really sure what we were doing. What I hadn't realised though was that they did takeaways as well. So we were there all night with the phone going and people queuing and chatting. For what we paid, I was really expecting something else. We'd been over to Greece on holiday, so we knew what to expect the first time we went, more or less. It's run by a family, and the mother does all the cooking, which means you really get a homemade taste. We thought it would have been more popular. In the end, we didn't have bothered booking. I loved the atmosphere as much as the food. Although the music was a bit loud, maybe, I think they have somebody playing live at weekends. All I'd heard about Japanese food before was that they eat uncooked fish, so I wasn't really sure when Alex suggested it. It said in the advert in the paper that booking wasn't necessary, so maybe it's not very popular. The problem is not knowing what to order, but the waiters were helpful, apart from a bit of a language problem. I was surprised that there was such a range of different dishes. What we had was quite salty, but I suppose you should expect that with fish. I'd have to say that it's an acquired taste. Alex was keen, but he'll try anything once. Those of you who have seen Channel Twelve's latest cookery program, Leave It to Cook, will be familiar with my next guests. Chef Trisha White and comedian Patrick Hamilton. Trisha, how did you first become a TV chef? It all happened completely by chance. I was working at the Hilton when I suddenly got a phone call asking me to rush over to the studio. Their regular TV chef had got ill, and they wondered if I could take over for one program. In the end, I seemed to do a good enough job, and they asked me to do a whole series. And I came up with the idea for Leave It to Cook. And how did you get involved, Patrick? Well, as your listeners will know if they've seen the program, at the start of the series, I couldn't cook a thing. You know, I'm one of those men who went straight from my mum's cooking to my wife's. Channel Twelve contacted me, and we actually did a cooking audition. I made a complete mess, and they said I was the man for the job. Now, each week, you, Trisha, choose a dish, demonstrate how to make it, and then Patrick has a go. 
That's right. We hope to show that there really isn't any great secret to good basic cookery. I think Patrick will agree that some of his efforts are better than others, but we want to get across the idea that everybody can have a go. The idea is that if I can learn to do it, then so can anybody. Before the series, I really was the kind of person who would even burn water. Now, though, I think that I could feed myself if I had to. Men, especially, are very bad at looking after themselves, and we want to make the point that with five minutes thought and twenty minutes cooking a day, you can really improve your diet. What does your family think about your new abilities? Well, my wife cooks very well, so I don't think her position is under threat just yet. There have been one or two experiments, like my Spanish omelet with chocolate, that the dog appreciated more than my children. <laughs> But on the whole, they think it's a positive thing. Trisha, what would be your tips for listeners who are thinking of taking up cooking? First of all, don't be afraid. Even if it's a disaster, you can always order a takeaway. Secondly, experiment. You can only find what you like if you try some things you don't like. Follow the basic principles you learn through the series, and then follow your nose. You can't go too far wrong. And now, over to Elaine in the weather room. Hello, and a very good evening to you all. Well, another hot day today, reaching thirty-eight degrees in some parts of the country, and it's going to get even hotter tomorrow. Yes, we're really in the middle of a heat wave now. It could even reach as high as forty-four degrees in parts of the southeast tomorrow. The good news is that there's very little humidity in the air—only sixteen percent, in fact. So we won't all be sweating too much. But it is going to be bright, particularly around midday and in the early afternoon. And there's going to be very little cloud for most of the day. So do put on that sunscreen if you're going to be outside. It was twenty past two, and the match was supposed to start at half past. We didn't know what to do. Pouring with rain it was, but the stadium was still full. Then we got word that their bus had crashed on the way here, hit a car or something. No one was injured, thank goodness. But they weren't going to make it. Well, that was it. I had to make an announcement that the match had been cancelled. Some of the usual hooligans in the crowd started to make a bit of trouble, of course. But the police soon put a stop to that. No, no. There's absolutely no way I can get back today. We're basically snowed in here. Yeah, I've tried. There are no flights at all. Look, I'm going to be at John's house. Yeah, my brother. That's right. You've got the number, haven't you? Okay, but I want to ask you a favor. Can you look on my desk and see if there's a file with Winchester written on the top? You got it. Great. He's one of our best clients, and I've got to get in touch with him today. What? Cancel the order? When? Are you sure? Okay. Well, give me his number, and I'll call him immediately. Well, I don't really care about that. I mean, we're not the kind to be lying on the beach all day sunbathing anyway, are we? No. True. But we don't want to go anywhere chilly, do we? It won't be chilly. It's the middle of summer. Well, the brochure says you need to take a jumper. That sounds like chilly to me. You're just being silly. It'll be fine during the day. Anyway, you know you always moan if it's too humid. It's better to go somewhere a bit cooler. Oh, we're not going anywhere humid. That's for sure. Well, at least we agree on something. With a top temperature of twenty-four degrees. Tomorrow, very much like today, in fact, with most of the country still enjoying the sunshine we've been experiencing over the past few days, expect some gales in the north. However, so hold on to your hats towards mid-morning, and it'll probably be a bit more cloudy up there than it is down south too. But it should remain dry. In the meantime, I'm standing in what was until yesterday. The main road through the picturesque town of Moxham. As you can see, it's now a river flowing through the town. The water's way above my ankles, and I must say I'm rather glad I brought a good pair of wellies with me. As the clean-up operation starts in earnest, 
Local residents are now asking why this happened. A burst water drainage pipe on the outskirts of town has been located, but as there's been no rainfall here at all over the last few weeks, the question still remains as to what exactly led to the breakage and where the water came from. Local councillor Jason Parks is placing the blame. And I don't think even Professor Warren can disagree with me on that. No, Shirley's absolutely right to say that global warming is now a reality, and we have to face up to it. And there's also no doubt that it's going to have a very great impact on life on this planet over the next few thousand years or so. There's no going back, if you like. Quite, but whether the human race is responsible for what's happened is still open to debate, in my opinion. Oh come on! The evidence is overwhelming. Yes, the evidence that you care to put forward, but I can come up with equally. Makes my life a misery. It does the snow, and we always get it here, regular as clockwork. First week of January, down it comes. Snowed in for three weeks. We were last winter, and you know, in this line of work, we've got over six hundred beef cattle. You know, all told, if you can't keep the animals healthy and well fed, you're done for. No cows, no meat, no meat, no money. Well, it's just ridiculous, isn't it? I mean, there's no excuse. The biggest storm for the last thirty years. Who knows how much damage has been done? Frightening, really, and they failed to predict it. They've only got one thing to do. For goodness' sake, tell us what the weather's going to be tomorrow, and they can't even get that right. It's laughable. It really is. Well, the joke's on them for sure this time. People aren't going to put up with it any longer. I can tell you. Hello and welcome to another edition of Search and Find, the show that showcases the best websites on the net. This week we're going to start by taking you to a lovely little site, Weather Watchers, which you'll find rather a weird address. This at www.www.co.uk. It's absolutely free and it's all about the strangest kinds of weather recorded throughout history. And strange they certainly are. Forget about raining cats and dogs. This site has some far weirder examples. Did you know there are recorded cases of it raining frogs, stones, blood, and even lizards? But there's all sorts of other useful information too. In fact, anything you want to know about the weather since they first started collecting data several hundred years ago. Want to know the hottest day on record in Britain? It's there. Which town has the highest average rainfall each year? This will tell you. Want to know every occasion it snowed in London in the last four hundred years? Well, you can find out here. Another interesting feature is the quiz page. There are over a thousand questions in total, graded from beginner through to expert. See how much you really know about weather and climate. And if you want to know the difference between a tornado and a cyclone, or when a gale becomes a hurricane, there's a handy little dictionary where you just click on the word and up comes an explanation, usually with photos or video film. It's bright, fun, and informative, and there are some useful links too to other weather-related websites, like the Meteorological Office's own official website. The website's very easy to navigate around, so it's ideal for teenagers doing a school project. But anyone interested in matters meteorological should check it out. The whole thing was put together by students from Goldman College, so a big thumbs up to them. And now let's move on to another website. One. Hello, and I'm Chris Turner, and I'm fourteen and a half years old. Making up my phone number. It's o four two three eight one seven three six four. That's o four two three eight one seven three six four. Well, if you're looking for a really good cheap camera, then I've got just the thing for you. It's a Tycon X three four hundred. It's black. It's got a carry case, and it's in fairly good condition. Takes excellent pics. I'm asking twenty five pounds for it, but if you make me an offer, I'll think about it. It's a good camera. 
Call me on 04-2381-7364. Two. Um, hello. My name's Helen. Um, Helen Foote. I'm 13 and my number's 078-322-331. 078-322-331. I am, um, and I'm looking for a second-hand CD player. It's got to be one of these portable ones, you know, that have earphones and stuff. I can afford up to uh, £15, so if anyone's got one, please give me a call. Please? My number's 078 322 331. 3. Hi everyone, Karen Singleton, 15 next April. Six seven two three nine zero nine zero double nine. That's um six seven three two. No, sorry, six seven two three nine zero nine zero double nine. And if you've got an old video camera, I really don't care how old it is, as long as it works, then give me a ring now. Oh yeah, one thing. My dad says that it's not worth it if it doesn't come with rechargeable batteries. So it's got to have them really. Or I don't want it. Anything up to about 40 quid. Okay? Thanks. Call Karen Singleton. That's me. On 672-390-9099. Call me now. 4. My name's Nicholas Dart and I'm 17 years old. You can reach me on my mobile all day on 5472 104 7835. Let, let, let me just say that again. That's 54721047835. I've got a mountain bike I've grown out of. It's ideal for someone around 15 years old. It's in perfect condition. It's made by tailors. Got 18 gears, only two and a half years old. And if you live nearby, I'll even deliver it to you free of charge. That's it, I think. I oh, know, wait, the price, £65 if that's OK. But we can talk about it on the phone. Call me, Nicholas Dart, on 54721047835. 5. Hello, my name's Jennifer Helen Page, and I was 16 yesterday. If you want to buy what I'm selling, call me before 12 on 1324659780. That's 1324659780. It's an electronic organiser. It's still in its box. Brand new, in fact. It's a handmade VDX. Does loads of cool things. The reason I'm selling it is because I got two exactly the same as birthday presents. There are £120 in the shops, but you can have it for 80 Can't say fairer than that, can you? You'll love it. So call me now. 1324-659-780. Bye. Well, you wouldn't believe it, would you, that this kind of thing could make such a difference to someone's life. But it really has. I mean, it used to take me hours to set the thing, and I'd always do it wrong, and end up taping the wrong program. And I do video rather a lot, I have to admit. With this thing, I just press a couple of buttons, and it's all programmed in. Don't even have to go near the machine. And look, I press this, and a list comes up on the screen telling me what's on tonight all the channels. Click this button here and it tells you what the program's about. Marvellous! Well, I was a bit sceptical at first, I have to admit. Couldn't really see the need. But then my neighbour Carl got one and he'd come over for a barbecue or something, snapping away all afternoon, and then he'd pull out a little screen and we could see what he'd taken. It was great! We'd choose the ones we'd like, he'd pop home, put them on his computer and print them out. Just like that. Good quality too. Course, if you want professional quality, you still have to take them to the chemist or whatever to get them processed onto proper paper. Once you've got one, and I'm not exaggerating, you really wonder how you ever managed without one. It's got all my phone numbers in it, a calculator, loads of things. And this one here, wow. I just press this button and it sends all the information to my laptop. I can even write emails on it. You know, to transfer to my PC later on. And really, it's smaller and lighter than a diary. 
so you can just slip it in your jacket pocket. Really handy. Oh, I don't know. I ought to use it more, really. Thought I would, but you know, if something exciting's happening, like a party or something, you want to be part of it, don't you? Don't want to be stuck just filming the whole thing. And let's be honest, who wants to sit through a three-hour video of people chatting? Not very interesting, is it really? I guess it would be great if you wanted to make a little movie, though, or something like that. Do you know what I like most about it? Are the little extra things you get with it. You know, there's an alarm clock and a calculator. It's even got a couple of games on it. I really only actually use it to make calls if it's an emergency. You know, if the car breaks down or something, and you're miles from anywhere. I've never actually sent a text message, but my husband sometimes sends me one asking me to record a program or something if he's going to be late home from the office. I'm not very good at setting the video though, so I usually pretend I didn't get it. I'm very pleased to be joined in the studio by Marjorie and Steve Renwick, the founders of the hugely successful website Friends Back Together. Marjorie, can I start by asking you how did the idea for the website come about? Well, it was about two and a half years ago, and I was trying to organise a school reunion. It was so difficult, you know. Everyone had moved to different parts of the country. Some people had moved abroad. Lots of the girls I'd been to school with were married, and so of course had changed their surnames. And I was, well, I was basically tearing my hair out. And Steve just turned to me and said, "This calls for the internet." And the idea was born. So that was what two and a half years ago? Yes, but it took a while to set up. Of course, we didn't actually open for business, as it were, for about a year after that. March the sixth last year, in fact. That's right, and it proved to be the most successful website of the year. How many people have visited your site? It's actually incredible when you think about it. We're now getting about a hundred and fifty thousand visitors a week. That's almost a million each. Do you know? Do you know? Since we started, there must have been well over eight million visitors, and over three quarters of them have entered their information. Why do you think it's so popular? I think it fills a need. You know, you make such good friends during your school days, and then inevitably you drift apart. And in the past, it was just too difficult to get back in touch with them, as we found out ourselves when Marjorie was trying to get her reunion together. I think it's also, you know, we're all naturally inquisitive. We're always thinking, I wonder what they're up to now, and things like that. With friends back together, you can find out how people you used to know are getting on, and hopefully meet up with some of them. You've had some great successes in that department, I believe. Some lovely stories, yes. There was a couple you probably read about them in the press, both in their eighties, hadn't seen each other for over fifty years, met through friends back together, and got married last month. It really does make it all worthwhile. Wonderful. So. Where do you go from here? Well, we're actually extremely busy running the site at the moment. It's quite time-consuming, much more than you'd think, to be honest. But we're planning to take a break early next year, and then. Well, let's just say we've got a couple of major projects in the pipeline on the internet. Can you give us any clues? Let's just say that they will be on the internet. They'll be designed to bring people together. They'll be unique. But they won't be like friends back together at all. I can't say any more. Well, the very best of luck with whatever you go on to do. Thank you so much for being here today, and thank you also for friends back together. You've brought some sunshine into a lot of people's lives. Thank, thank you. Thank you for having us. Speaker one. It gets worse every time it rains, and it's starting to get really dangerous. The road surface needs completely replacing. There are holes everywhere, and I'm worried that a car is going to come round this bend and the driver is going to lose control. I must have called a dozen times, and they still haven't sent anyone round to have a look. They say there are other, more important problems. I know they have to repair all the roads around here, but it's been like this for over two years now. Speaker two. They come through here because they can get into the centre of town more quickly. This road wasn't built for that amount of traffic, though. 
It's only narrow. This is a residential area, and there are children playing in the street. One of these days, there'll be a serious accident, but there are things that could be done to prevent it. I've called them to come and stop drivers who are speeding, but they say they are too busy catching the real criminals. They just don't want to know. They'll be sorry one day. Speaker three. It's just so dangerous for them in the streets where they can get knocked down. I see them from my window. They play games in the road, and cars come racing around that corner without slowing down. One girl was hit last month. Luckily, it wasn't serious, but they might not be so fortunate next time. They shouldn't be allowed to play there, really. I make sure my daughter is where I can keep my eye on her. Speaker four. It seems to me that they don't have all the training they need to move around town safely. All the driving instructors do is help them get through the test, and who can blame them? Well, I've taken the test, and I know that it's very easy. You can't expect people to be safe drivers when all they have to do to pass is go round a couple of corners. They should introduce new laws over the whole country to make the test harder. That way, we might have people who are better drivers. Soon, traffic jams will be a thing of the past. The solar mobile lets you go right over them. Soon you'll be able to completely forget about the cost of petrol. The solar mobile simply uses electricity from your home to recharge its batteries. Soon you'll be free to go where you want to, when you want to. It's coming, and it's going to be big. It's the most fun you can have around town. There's no need for ugly roads anymore with the solar mobile. Simply step onto your solar mobile, and you'll be lifted six inches into the air. The solar mobile floats above the ground, giving you a smoother, more comfortable ride. With speeds of up to 15 kilometers per hour, you'll be there in no time. The solar mobile is taking off around the world, and you could be the first in your street to own one. Now, in this country, for the first time, the solar mobile will make you the envy of your friends. Whether you need to get to school before the first bell, or you need to be at your desk before your boss gets in, the solar mobile will keep you one step ahead of the rest. Call O seven three two five Solar Mobile now for more details on how you can take part in the transport revolution. It was the oldest coach you've ever seen. Couldn't believe it when the driver turned up. He was very apologetic, but it was the only one available. Apparently, something to do with his manager making a double booking. At least that's what he said. We set off, and there was no air conditioning, and this was in the middle of summer. He opened the windows, but it didn't help. It was a long way as well. I thought we were going to get lost at one point, but it was some kind of shortcut that the driver had found on the map. In the end, we were half an hour early. In this line of work, you see, you have to be very careful because you're dealing with people's lives every day. The public expect to be able to turn up, get on the hydrofoil or ferry or whatever, and set off. It's a lot more complicated than just buying a ticket and getting on, though. There are safety checks and all kinds of paperwork to be done before we can give the OK for a captain to leave. It's our responsibility, after all, to ensure that the people who come through here get the standard of service they want at an acceptable level of risk. And it is the policies of this current government which are to blame. As with the attempt to lower the speed limit on motorways, the prime minister has shown again that he just doesn't have the power to get things done. 
unless he can deal effectively with this relatively simple matter of providing enough spaces, he has no hope of tackling the wider problems of motoring, like pollution. Construction has to start immediately across the country, and we have to start approving schemes for building areas underneath city centres, or we'll very quickly find ourselves in a very. Oh, it sounds lovely! Listen, let our displays of the history of the railways take you back in time to the days of luxury trains. I've always wanted to know more about that era. When are we supposed to be visiting your mother?、Uh, Friday. What's today? Tuesday. We could drive up on Thursday morning, visit the museum in the afternoon, and stay overnight in a hotel. Then we could go on to mother's on Friday morning. Hmm. Would that give us enough time? Well, if we set off early enough, we'd have a few hours to look round the museum. It's not that. I can't leave until ten on Thursday. It's five hours to get there. Don't forget. The way you drive, it is four with me behind the wheel. Don't worry, it'll be fine. Sorry, but it's just that. Well, I've been trying for ten minutes and I can't seem to. You know, the man in front is snoring rather loudly, and it makes it very difficult for me to. If I could just turn it up, then. I don't mean you should disturb him or anything, but. How he sleeps through it himself, I've no idea. Because if it was me, it's this part here that doesn't seem to. Maybe it'd be better if. No, that can't be how, is it? Scandal on rails, it was called. All about the privatisation of the rail industry and what a disaster it's been. There was a lot of accusations and finger pointing. Most of them seem to deserve it, from what I know about the situation. Some incredible statistics, most of them coming from the government itself. Didn't mention the recent accidents around London, though. That would have been my first question. What are they going to do about that? Still, I bet it made a few powerful people feel a bit uncomfortable. John, it's Roger. What noise? Oh, I'm on the train. Yes, that's right. Don't be surprised if I disappear into a tunnel. Where are you? Well, at least you won't be disappearing then. Listen, have you got the takeover figures with you? In the car. Okay, listen. Go and get them and call me back in ten minutes. We really need to go through them before I meet the managers. About another hour, I suppose. Okay, I'll speak to you later. Bye. Really? Sorry, I know it's inconvenient, but Rita just asked me, and it's in the opposite direction. I see. So that's how highly you value our friendship, is it? Look, maybe I can get Joel to give you a lift. I can't remember if he came in his car or not. That is by the by. If you knew how to treat a lady, you'd make sure I got home safely. It's just impossible, and I do wish you wouldn't rely on. Never mind. I shall make alternative arrangements. Excuse me, sir. Do you have a moment? Well, yes, I suppose so. How long is it going to take? Just a couple of minutes. It's about transport facilities in the local area. Could I ask what occupation you're in? Well, I was a computer programmer for nearly fifteen years, but I left a couple of years ago and retrained as a teacher. So you'd better put that. Do you use public transport at all? Yes, as a matter of fact, I do. Would that be every day, less than three times a week, or not even that often? Well, I don't have a car, so I do rely on buses quite a bit. There's the library and the town centre, and there's going shopping. I'd say it's probably something like five times a week.、Hmm. Would you say there were any problems with the routes you take? Now you mention it, there are one or two things that could be better. Nobody wants to travel on dirty buses. And sometimes they look like they haven't been cleaned for months. And then there's the cost. It seems like the fare goes up every couple of months for no good reason. Are there any aspects of the service which you believe work well? You don't want to be waiting for too long when you have to get to work. The buses are on time, which is a big improvement. I remember when you couldn't be sure whether the 501 would turn up or not. The monthly bus pass is another good thing. 
I don't have to worry about change now because I can just buy my pass once a month and, and keep it in my wallet. Now, I don't know if you've heard of the new park and ride scheme we're thinking of setting up. The idea is that visitors stop at large car parks on the edge of the town, and a special bus service takes them into the town centre. Sounds like a good idea. Two locations are being considered for the car park. The first is in the north, and the second in the south. Which of those would you prefer? Well, when you say the north, I suppose you mean in the area around Upton. That's logical from one point of view, because there are lots of tourists coming that way. There might be a problem though with it being a long way from the centre. I can't see people wanting to spend half an hour on a bus to do a bit of shopping. And the site in the south? That would be in the riverside area. You can see how it would help local development. The people in that area have needed something for a long time. One positive point is that it would probably create more jobs locally. The downside is that the building work would probably cause a lot of environmental damage. Riverside is a beautiful area, and you're talking about building a great big car park, not to mention bus shelters and things like that. Thank you for your time. Not at all. Speaker one. Spending that amount of time inside can really change how you view things. I never thought the outside world would have changed so much. We'd had TV, of course, but it's not the same as living it. I was lost for the first month. They should do something to help prisoners adjust to life outside and to keep in touch with what's happening. It's so easy to just commit a crime and go back because it's safer than trying to live in the real world. Speaker two. I only did six months in prison, but that was more than enough for me. I did do what they said I'd done, but I'm sorry for it now. It was my first offence as well. I know that some people say that prison doesn't work. Well, it did for me. Well, I can tell you. If there's one thing keeping me honest today, it's the thought of going back in that place. I don't care how many work programs and table tennis tables they give you. You're not free, and that's that. Speaker three. They weren't such a bad bunch of people in there. Most of them are all right when they're in prison. It's when they're on the outside that they have problems. I think we need to spot the people with problems sooner and stop them going to prison in the first place. Once you're in there, you're spending 24 hours a day with criminals, even if they are generally nice criminals. It doesn't really help you give up a life of crime. Speaker four. Nothing can give me back the wasted years that I spent in prison. I said I was innocent for all those years, and finally they proved I hadn't done it. When they caught the person who had done it, I was released. Ten years. I got some money, of course, so I don't have to work. But there was never an apology. What we need is more highly trained police officers who can look out for the kind of evidence that would have kept me out of prison. Since I first came here, there have been many changes. Rather than a place of punishment. We see ourselves as a place where correct behaviour is rewarded. As warden, I'm responsible for seeing that we keep control, which we do by keeping the men busy, but also that the men are prepared for life outside. Through our educational programmes, we hope to give the men skills they can use when they get out. Funds are limited, so we're not always able to offer the kind of facilities that we would like to offer, but we do our best. I guess I just started to hang out with the wrong crowd. In the end, I was caught for burglary, and I've been here for three months. I knew all about it from friends, so I think I'm managing to survive pretty well. We keep hearing about education and things like that, but the guards don't know how to teach. They just read from a book and expect you to learn something. We should have people in here who know what they're doing. As a prison inspector, I get to see the inside of many prisons, and I can tell you that this one is by no means the worst. However, where most of them have a fairly strict working regime, here the men are underemployed. Taking money from the library and spending it on tools and materials would certainly achieve better results. Keep them occupied, and they have no time to discuss plans or to worry about what's going to happen on the outside. It's the only way. 
I came here about ten years ago, so I've seen a lot of life inside. There's a joke amongst the guards that we've been in here longer than most of the prisoners. It makes all the difference in the world to be able to go home at night, though, I can tell you. There's a lot of debate about prison at the moment. What I see is the same faces coming back time and time again. The problem is that they go out, they're unemployed, they steal, and they're back in here. As long as they keep sending them, we'll have to keep dealing with them, won't we? I've been in here, oh, about five years now. It's not so bad, I suppose, but it's a long way from my family. The last place I was in, Pentonwood. Now that was the place to be sent to. Sports facilities, TV rooms, fully trained teachers. Only half an hour for my wife to come and visit. This place, well, it was a shock. I don't mind telling you. The warden's not so bad. He's got some good ideas, but the guards in here just never seem to get behind his suggestions. Not what I was used to. In trouble at twelve, in prison at eighteen, and a best-selling author at thirty-eight. My guest tonight is Michael McGregor, who describes himself in his latest book as still looking for trouble. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you. Now, you were released from Parkview Prison just over seven years ago. What was it like at Parkview? It wasn't too bad for most of the men in there. The food has improved a lot since the early days, and there's a lot more to do in prison than there was when I first went away at the age of eighteen. Did you feel that it prepared you for life on the outside? I'm not sure that any prison really does that. They might keep dangerous men off the streets, and they might prevent some people from committing crimes. You're on your own though when it comes to building a life for yourself. So how did you decide to build a life for yourself? I'd been in prison for something like ten years, and I decided that I'd had enough of that life, and I started to read and study. Someone suggested that I start to put some of my stories down on paper. My idea was that it might help young people stay out of trouble if they knew what had happened to me. Two years later, I had a book, and it just grew from there, really. Inside Out was a great success while you were still in prison. How did that feel? That was a little strange, but very satisfying at the same time. One of the things that pushes people into crime is the feeling that there's no hope in their lives. I think seeing that you could achieve things, even from inside prison, gave some of the people in prison a feeling of hope again. I was very proud of that. Your latest book, Over the Wall, goes back in time to your childhood. What do you think now when you look back at those years? I think a lot of things. First of all, I think how stupid I was. My family was always poor, but I don't blame that for the wrong things I did. You know, on TV and in the news, criminals are presented as people who try to blame anybody but themselves for their crimes. In fact, most people I met inside felt very guilty about the things they had done and blamed themselves. You've also been asked by the government to advise on changes to prisons, haven't you? Yes, that's right. Some major changes are being planned, particularly to the kind of courses being offered in prisons. It's felt that more education, particularly things like the use of computers, will help people stay out of prison. And I have to say, I agree. You also believe that sport can be a useful way of helping people to stay out of trouble. Yes, I know from my own experience that sport becomes very important in prison. It gives prisoners an aim and a reason to work together. When you eventually leave prison, it's essential that you know how to work with other people. Now, you mentioned some of your plans for the future before the show. I know that a film studio.